I am. We're going to be administering the sacrament of baptism to uh, one of our covenant children. And I think uh, that little Anna was uh, just born yesterday. Is that right? <laughs> Sims don't, they don't let grass grow under their feet. What a sweet family. She, le- she looks even smaller in the, in the big hands of her big dad. Yeah, I know. April always tells me when I hold a baby, you look like a giant. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. Well, you are kind of big. That's a good thing, by That's the way. Right. <laughs> why, don't you, uh, why don't you share, before we get started, a little bit about uh, how you came up with her name? Uh, we uh, love, uh, well, Hannah, of course, is from the Old Testament, and it means grace, and uh, Anna is just a modification of that name, and uh, Victoria is Latin for victory, and so they're both in the nominative case, so uh, Anna Victoria, grace the victory, and, uh, and so we, we just thought that would be such a sweet name for a child to have, so uh, I apologize for dragging you into the nominative case of Latin, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what happened. That's you never know what we're going to get from Travis right. when, he, when, he, when he cuts loose on us. That's right. Let me put this back on me so I don't drop it. So we're going to be baptizing Anna Victoria Sims in just a moment. I want, me, want to explain uh, and remind you that the sacrament of baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. We're, our understanding uh, is that the child being baptized is not regenerated by virtue of baptism itself. Nevertheless, we do anticipate of that little Anna Victoria Sims, when she reaches what we refer to as the age of discretion, uh, will come to complete trust in Christ as her Lord and Savior. Uh, We understand uh, that administering the sacrament of baptism is a very serious, joyful event uh, for the church and for the family. And so I now would pose some questions to the family. Do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? We do. Do you claim God's covenant promises in her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your own? We do. And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise and humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her, uh, that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, do you? We do. Congregation, would you stand with me? I have this one question for you. Do you as a congregation, as a church family, undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in the Christian nurture of this child? Do you? Thank you. You may be seated. If you just move right here, just to the side, there you go. Anna Victoria Sims, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that you hold this little one in your strong and mighty hands, uh, that you enfold her in your love, encompass her in the love and the communion of the saints. Uh, We thank you, Father, for her birth, and we thank you for this family, her brothers and sisters, her mom and her dad, Our grandparents, we pray that they would all uh, see to the needs of this little one as she walks through life in Jesus' name. My friends, if you would continue in the spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, (laughs) I was wondering if you would go go ahead and pick that up or you're going to leave it there. Heavenly, sanctified, yes, indeed. Heavenly Father, we pray for this covenant child. Deliver her from the way of sin and death. Wash her and renew her by your life-giving spirit. 
open her heart to your grace and truth, drive her to Christ as her Savior and Lord, and keep her in the faith and fellowship of your church. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this family, grant them grace so to live before this covenant child, loving her, disciplining her, teaching her, and praying with her that their lives would be a living picture of the gospel. Lord, work through them, work beyond them, work against them when necessary to point this child to Christ so that all the promises of the covenant may be fulfilled in her life. And Lord, we pray for ourselves, the congregation of Grace Covenant Church. Grant us grace to see this child as our own, to love her, to pray for her, and to assist these parents in the Christian nurture of their children. And the people said, Amen. Amen indeed. God bless you guys. What a great, what a great privilege to be able to be part of this with your family. Thank you. And what a great looking family. Thank you. Aren't they swell? You can't see, maybe you've already already seen uh, Anna up close, but as Dee Dee said, uh, it's a Sims face for sure. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, buddy. I'll give them a chance to get settled. And so we'll continue with our study of James this morning. Uh, we are yet in the first chapter of James. The text this morning will be chapter 1 of James, uh, verses 9 through 11. You'll also have in your bulletin chapter 2 and some verses there, and I've decided to hold off on that. And that'll be really part 2 of part 1 of the sermon today. Uh, which we'll do uh, at a future time. So let me read now to you our text, beginning with verse 9 of chapter 1. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and his flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. This is the word of God. Father, we pray that you would receive our worship this morning and the study of your word. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray you illumine our hearts and minds as we do indeed study your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So in verse 9, James is encouraging Jewish Christians who may be destitute or simply struggling to survive. Recall who James is writing to here from verse 1. The twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. The persecution which began in Jerusalem with the stoning of Deacon Stephen had begun a diaspora. The Christians who were driven from Jerusalem in fear of their lives would settle in towns and cities around the Mediterranean, and therefore we have what James refers to the tribes who are dispersed abroad. These Jewish Christians would have left Jerusalem with very little, and perhaps what little they had is already gone. They are aliens in foreign countries and cities. They wouldn't have a great deal. They wouldn't have a lot to give them any sense of status. Their security wouldn't be financial. Their security would be in Christ alone. And so James here is reminding them of the riches that they have in Jesus Christ. And subsequently, he is reminding you and me of the riches we have in Christ. As Christians, we are not dependent 
on the circumstances of our lives. Nor are we dependent on the high opinion of our fellows or of our community, of anyone, save Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we have an inheritance which will never perish. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. The temptation that you and I share is to see ourselves as the world sees us, to gain our sense of value and worth from what the world does for us, with us. But James, the brother of Jesus, is here calling us away from that tendency so that we would more and more learn to discipline ourselves to find our sense of value and worth in Christ alone. Recognizing that there waits for us a glorious inheritance for all eternity. In verse 10, James shifts a bit. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. So James is referring to folks who possess great wealth. The rich man, as he puts it. While the man of hum humble circumstance is referred to as a brother, the rich man is not identified as a brother or as a believer. There are commentators who suggest that the fact that this rich man is not referred to as a brother doesn't mean that he's not talking about a Christian, but the context of this passage, I think, leaves very little doubt uh, that the rich man that's spoken of here is not a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, that said, there is no suggestion at all that Christians can't be rich or wealthy. That, that's not the point of this passage. If we consider the scope of the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, we find that indeed there are many who loved God who possessed great wealth, whether in the Old Testament or the New. The very tomb in which our Lord was placed after the crucifixion was given by a believer in Christ who possessed great wealth, high position in Jerusalem. And so we want to be very clear that James is making a contrast with the eternal destiny of a poor brother in Christ and the eternal destiny, even the temporal problems of an unbeliever, an unbeliever who possesses great wealth. Now, James has many reasons to call our attention uh, to this contrast. For he lived in a community that uh, was very separated by wealth and by position. He understood uh, the nature of persecution. Indeed, his brother, our Lord Jesus Christ, was crucified by the rich, by the powerful of that Jerusalem community. And we understand that James himself would face a savage execution, thrown from the roof of the temple, still living, beat to death with a club. And so James perhaps knew that there was a divide between 
the believer and the unbeliever, those who possess little and those who possess a lot. James continues in verse 11 in our text. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Now that is a passage of Scripture, a verse. Uh, that ought to give us pause as we reflect on how we ourselves uh, deal with our ambitions, our desires, uh, the position that we perhaps aspire toward, uh, the wealth that we covet. We recognize uh, that some of us have more problems with those sorts of things than others. But all of us to some degree struggle with this. We think of the great civilizations that are spoken of in the Word of God. The great civilizations talked about and written of in the Old Testament and, and even in the New. We think of the ancient civilization of Persia, a great civilization, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and in the New Testament, uh, the great empire of Rome itself. And we recognize that time has been the enemy of these civilizations, for they are nowhere to be found in the forms that they had when spoken of in Scripture. These great civilizations produce many things, good things and bad. Many astounding monuments to their greatness in their time. We think of the the seven great wonders of the ancient world. Uh, we think of, for example, the great lighthouse in Alexandria, Egypt, or the Colossus, that great statue that stood astride of the opening to the harbor of Rhodes. We think of the mausoleum of the Persian king, Korea. We think of the great temple of Artemis, or the statue of Zeus in Olympia, Greece are uh, those what must have been quite beautiful hanging gardens of Babylon. And out of these great wonders of the ancient world, there's only one yet standing, and that's the Great Pyramid of Giza. But even that Great Pyramid, uh, though it impresses us, and though we wonder about how they were able to do such a feat with the engineering and the particular tools that they may have had at that time, it has lost its glory. So we recognize that time does its work on all of man's temporal accomplishments. And we think of the towns and the cities that many of our epistles were written to, the churches there in Colossae, the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus. These cities are ruins today. Even, even where there are inhabited, uh, people that are inhabiting the areas, the cities aren't what they were at the time that the apostle wrote his letters to those churches. And so then when James calls our attention uh, to the fact uh, that the pursuits of the rich men will ultimately come to naught, uh, we recognize that he knows what he's talking about. Again, at the end of verse 11, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits. You know, we never know what moment will be our last, what day will be our last day on this earth. It's very unusual that folks have a consciousness of that. And it is more typical uh, that we set our plans for the future. We anticipate where we want to go. We have our bucket list, as they say. We, we want to visit this place or we want to do this particular thing. Not recognizing that God has already set the day of our death. Doesn't mean we ought not to plan. Doesn't mean that we ought not to anticipate and to look forward to certain things. But always with a degree of humility. Recognizing that no matter how successful we may have been in this life, uh, we can't take our success with us. The only thing that we can take with us is our faith in Jesus Christ and perhaps, and perhaps, the folks that we have 
been able to influence to trust Christ as well. Many years ago, I heard a preacher talking about uh, officiating uh, or ministering at funerals, and you've probably heard this before, uh, but I think of it quite often. He said that as many times as he had, had preached at a funeral, seen the hearse moving into place, he had never seen a U-Haul trailer behind the hearse. And that's really quite true, isn't it? It is a way to call our attention to the fact that no matter how affluent we might be, how much stuff we might have acquired, we can't take it with us, none of it. We need to be reminded of that. Now, let's consider some points to help us understand what our attitude toward money ought to be. Should it be that we are hostile or antagonistic uh, to money? Uh, should we not give it any attention at all, any thought at all? Uh, should we avoid it? Should we seek to use it to manipulate people, even indeed those in power? Is that the way we ought to look at money? Or as Christians, should we look at money a different way? First, money itself is neither inherently good, nor is it bad. It isn't. Either one. Many people misunderstand a scripture. You probably know the one I'm speaking of uh, in Paul's epistle to Timothy. In the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy, verse 10, listen to this. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So many people misquote this, and they say something like, well, the love of money is the root of all evil. What the apostle is explaining to us here is that the love of money can lead us down a pathway uh, that will present us with all sorts of temptations, uh, many of them which result in sin. If we go back to verse 9, just before that one, we get even a little more insight. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires will plunge men into ruin and destruction. And so we understand uh, that wealth and, and riches do present temptations to us. Not necessarily the thing itself, not necessarily the money itself, but what that money can buy for us. And those that have a lot of money have a lot of opportunities to do things that those of us who don't have a lot of money uh, perhaps uh, don't have the opportunity to do. And therefore, there are greater temptations for those who have money. There are also greater responsibilities that come with great wealth. I, over the years, have, have known a lot of folks, both before I became a pastor and while I've been pastor, uh, who have a great deal of money. And one thing I know is that it does present very particular temptations to them. As I said, their, their lifestyle uh, can itself be a temptation. They're put into a, a level of society that presents them certain temptations. And even though you might suppose, well, if you have all the money you need, you wouldn't really care what other people think, well, my experience has been that it's the opposite. Folks who have social status uh, tend to care a great deal about social status. Now that in itself is not necessarily a problem unless it gets in the way of our faith and our walk with Jesus Christ. And so let me, again, just lay it out there. If you desire to be rich, if you desire to have great wealth, if you seek an affluent lifestyle, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But you should understand that you will face temptations and you will have tremendous responsibility. Your responsibility to be to steward the great resources that God entrusts in you. I remember one particular family that had great wealth and they were relatively generous uh, to our church over the years. But I knew something of the particulars about their wealth. I knew that though they 
were generous. It represented a very small amount. Their giving and their, their gifts, a very, very small amount of what they actually possessed. I, I knew, for example, that the wife had a, a buyer for clothes. And the average monthly bill for the money that was spent on clothes was about $2,400 a month. They didn't give that much to the church. Now, there's a sense in which that's none of the preacher's business. But I knew him well enough to know these things. And it didn't upset me. It made me sad. And it made me fear for them. Because to whom much is given, much is expected. I remember a story years ago as a young Christian preacher was talking about visiting a member of the congregation that had some questions about tithing and this person wanted to do what was right. He said he wanted to do what was right, what God required of him. And the preacher was visiting with him about that. And the preacher simply read some scriptures that dealt with giving and tithing. And the man said, oh gosh, preacher, I just can't tithe. And he said, preacher said, well, okay, why not? He said, well, I've, I've got too much money. If I give 10% of what, what I have, it's an extraordinary amount of money. And so the preacher said, I think I can resolve your problem. Would you pray with me? And so the preacher began to pray, oh God, please take this man's wealth away from him. <laughs> You can imagine the consternation on the guy's face. Now, I don't actually know if that really happened. It's a good story. And it does illustrate something. Wealth and riches do present an opportunity for temptation to those who have believed in Christ. Now, another thing about money is that it has a way of revealing our hearts to us, to our families, and, and to others. John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil. Rockefeller said to be the first real billionaire in America. Extraordinary money, extraordinary amount of money, extraordinarily capable and able individual. Along the way though, as he was older and had already acquired a great deal of wealth, uh, a friend asked him, John, when will you have enough money? And Rockefeller looked at him. He said, when I get just a little bit more. The second point, Scripture doesn't say that men shouldn't have wealth. I've made that point a couple of times already. The passage that I think comes closest to helping us understand this is the 18th chapter of Luke. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to chapter 18 of Luke. And this will be a familiar narrative that in your Bible probably carries the subtitle, The Rich Young Ruler. Well, let me read verses 18. This is Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 18 through verse 27. A ruler questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. Let me stop here. That's not true. I think, though, that we can grant this young man that he was an extraordinary young man and that he did purpose to live a very righteous life. Undoubtedly, he had the reputation of a young man who believed in God and sought to live a righteous life. But the truth is, if we believe the words of our Lord, we recognize that, that we commit these sins often inadvertently in our heart and the quietness of her heart. Now, let's go on. All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. 
Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, These things, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Now, uh, many of you have heard the, the explanation of the particular illustration that the Lord gives. Uh, there is a supposition that the eye of a needle is a particular gate that was present in the walls around Jerusalem. Uh, it was one which, which you, a, a man could go through, but it wasn't a big opening, it wasn't a big gate. And so the suggestion is that that's the reference here of our Lord. He's talking about a gate. And that may make us feel better, but really if we read the whole thing, I, I don't think that that interpretation is the right one. I think our Lord was trying to make a point uh, that there is great danger if you possess great wealth. Uh, there's especially great danger uh, to your soul before you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you have a sense of independence, of self-sufficiency. You don't feel like you need anything. And so when you hear something, I'm just speaking hypothetically, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you suppose, no, everything's, everything's fine. I have a good life. I'm not hurting anybody. I don't necessarily believe that I have to, have to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ insofar as that person might understand it. The encouragement here, though, is the last part of this, this passage where our Lord says these, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. And that calls our attention to the fact that God is in the business of working miracles. He certainly can save uh, a rich person just as he can save a poor person. And the fact that someone is wealthy need not get in the way of their salvation. Now, going back to the rich young ruler, some suppose that the fact that our Lord told him to go and sell all his possessions and give the proceeds uh, to the care of the poor. Some suppose that our Lord was a Marxist, an incipient communist. And what he was teaching there uh, was that no one should have private property. They should give everything they have uh, to the society at large or, or perhaps to those that, that are in need. I, doing graduate work in history uh, in a university where uh, there were just a whole lot of Marxist professors. I heard these kinds of things quite often, other passages of Scripture that they would take out of context and in their ignorance of the Scripture, they would often say things like that. That's not at all what this passage teaches. What this passage is teaching us is in the instance, it's not normative, first of all. It's not a normative passage. You know the difference? A passage of Scripture that's intended to be normative is to be applied universally to all circumstances, all times, to all men. That's not the point here at all. Our Lord was speaking to an individual person, to a, an extraordinary young man. And He was looking into his heart, as only God can do. And He was telling him, your problem, my friend, is you're an idol worshiper and your idol is your wealth and your position and your idol is getting between me and you and if you want to believe in God and you want to follow me Christ speaking uh, you must be willing to get rid of your idol now that portion is normative men who have an idol and all of us tend to have idols in our life it's an ongoing struggle to keep idols out of our life those who have an idol in their life have to be willing to get rid of the idol if they're going to follow Jesus because it will become clear very soon, my friend, if you have an idol that gets in the way of your obedience to follow Christ as your Lord. This rich young ruler was an idol worshiper. As I think about this, I wonder if 
you and I had been there, had the opportunity to see our Lord face to face and have a conversation like that with Him, we do it now in faith alone. But, but this young man was talking to Him as I'm talking to you right now. He would have just been a few feet away from Jesus Christ. If that were you and you had that kind of conversation with Jesus and He said, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, what would you do? What would I do? You say, oh, it's, that's easy. I would do what our Lord says. But do you do all that our Lord tells you to do now in the Scripture through eyes of faith? Think about that. It perhaps wouldn't be money. Perhaps it's simply the choices that you have before you in your life. Perhaps it's vocation or vacation. Or perhaps it's, it's those that you would befriend. Those who are your friends. Uh, those who are in need in your church, whatever the particular concern might be, if Jesus were before you and said, take care of this problem, would you be willing to do it? Let's be honest enough to say that we probably would struggle. We hope that we wouldn't make the decision that the rich young ruler made. We hope that we would heed the instruction of our Lord. With God's help, we hope that we would have gladly given away whatever we had and any future opportunities we have in order to follow the Lord. We hope that. But would we? Third point. Money, wealth, affluence. They tend to become the criterion that we use to determine how successful we are. Now, I've said this already perhaps more than once. It's not unusual. Some people are more prone to this than others. Honestly, some, some folks don't give a whole lot of thought to this. Uh, some give it some thought. Some give it a lot of thought. But it makes you so very vulnerable if you fall into this trap to allow other people to determine your success. As a Christian, you should not. You cannot do that. You have to understand that what impresses the world seldom impresses God. You must not allow people to determine your value and your worth, whether you are poor or you are rich, whether you are gifted or not so much, whether you are very intelligent or not so much. You cannot allow others to determine your sense of worth. That's the temptation. Now, if you have a financial advisor, and I know some of you do, when you're consulting with them, when you're reviewing your portfolio, it's not unusual at all uh, for the discussion to involve some particulars on how much money you happen to have. And there's a term for this, net worth. In other words, one of the things that you do when you're trying to determine how you might be a good steward is what your net worth is. Has it gone down? Has it gone up due to the the volatility of the equity market, stock market, or maybe you bought bonds you shouldn't have bought, or maybe you need to buy bonds, or maybe you've done well with the real estate you've purchased, or maybe not so well. Anyway, these kinds of discussions are very appropriate in the context of talking to someone who's trying to give you a good advice about being a good steward, how you might do a better job. Your net worth is simple. You just take your assets, subtract your liabilities, and what's left is net worth. Some folks have a great net worth. Some, not so much. When it becomes a problem, though, is when we begin to look at our sense of success as our net worth. And you must be honest with yourself about this. And if that's your tendency, be very careful because that understanding 
of our, of our worth and our value in life is absolutely toxic to the faith. It will, it will destroy whatever blessings God has intended for you in this world. If you're a believer, you're on your way to heaven. Nobody's going to take that away from you. But there's a lot more that He wants to give us here in this world, in the temporal realm. And if we allow ourselves to be seduced by the world, much of that will escape us. James knew this. And that's why he draws a contrast here between the believer and, and, and who may, well, I think we can assume had virtually no net worth. And these folks who had been driven out of Jerusalem how he draws this contrast between those folks and high society there in Jerusalem and in Israel. Very conscious. He's very conscious of that differential. Just as perhaps we might even be today. You've heard it said that the, 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 the difference between uh, the very wealthy and, uh, and what we consider to be middle class is increasing. That's absolutely the case doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing, but it's a, it's a problem for any culture or society. So let me just ask you, who's, who's the better one? Who's better off? The person who possesses great wealth and riches in this life or the person who's a joint heir with Jesus Christ? You say, well, that's an easy one. Let's reinforce that thought. Chapter 16 of Luke, beginning with verse 19. We read the familiar story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, to heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Hell is not the place you want to be. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, now They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Do you get the allusion there to our Lord's resurrection? The argument has been settled. The matter has been settled. Christ rose from the dead. There is no excuse for those who know the Gospel of Jesus Christ to not trust in God with all their hearts, minds, and souls. Now, couple of points in closing, very briefly. First, in your life, purpose to demonstrate that though you may have some money, okay, some of you have got some money, make sure that it doesn't have you. I'm going to say it again. You may have some money, but please, my friends, be sure that the money doesn't have you. Do you get what I'm saying? Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, who was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, I knew him. He came to our church a couple of times. Extraordinary, extraordinary pastor-scholar. 
And I remember one time he was given an illustration. I don't remember his text or why he was talking about this. Uh, but he was pastor of a church uh, that was filled with what we would call old money. You know the difference? Old money and new money? Old money. People in Philadelphia, that their families had had great wealth for generations. And he said intermittently, in order to help folks take their spiritual temperature, he would encourage these folks that had a great deal of wealth to give more than they're comfortable with giving. He said, that's the way you tell whether or not your money has you. To be willing to give more than you're comfortable in giving. Stretch yourself. Second point, be certain that you haven't let material possessions uh, become your criteria for success. Now, I'm talking about your stuff. I like stuff. I've got some stuff. But I try to be careful with my stuff. I try not to borrow a bunch of money to purchase stuff. Especially if my stuff is what we call a depreciating asset, which many things that we spend money on are. Because in those instances, you can actually immediately end up owing more on that particular item than it's worth. Depreciating assets are cars, furniture, clothes. These are things that don't hold their value most of the time and will actually go down in value. And so you should not get yourself in debt to acquire these things. But now what's my point? This is not a financial freedom seminar. I'm, I'm trying to teach you something here. If you're willing to go into debt to purchase something that you may not really need, that tells you something about the condition of your heart. It tells you that you want to impress other people or that you're feeling so badly about yourself you want something to prop you up so that you can feel good about yourself. I get that. I do. Everyone here knows that I have a problem. It's called Ford F-150 pickups. <laughs> it's a problem. I recognize it. But I don't, I don't borrow more money on a truck then I can pay. I'm not going to do that. I have done that years ago, but I'm not going to do that now. Neither should you. So if you want to be able to figure out whether or not you're too impressed with stuff, and we are all impressed with stuff somewhat, maybe not the same stuff, guys, okay? But we're all impressed with stuff, whether it's clothes or homes. Homes are buying by and large, not an appreciating asset, by the way. I'm, as an old real estate person, I want to tell you that. Uh, but I have been in situations where I have had real estate, a lot of real estate, that actually went down in value, ended up owing more than I purchased it for. And so I left Houston when that happened. <laughs> but real estate is a little different if you, if you leverage it properly. You have the right loan-to-value ratio. Chances are you're not going to end up owing more on it than you, than you uh, borrow. Practical advice for you, my friends, especially you youngsters. But in most instances, if you're, if you're going into debt, which, by the way, enslaves you, if you're going into debt, you're probably, you're probably dealing with some problems. And so, you need a little help. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your blessings and grace. I thank you for these folks. I pray that all of us, this preacher included, maybe this preacher especially, uh, would take heed to the three verses we've studied this morning. Help us, Father, to be the kind of, of children in your family uh, that make an impression on the world. Not, not that the world's impressed by us, but their attention is called to you because of the life we lead. I pray for each one here uh, that their eyes will be set on eternity and their inheritance in Christ. And while passing through this, this brief time that we have on this earth, I will not allow the world to get hold of us. We seek that the Holy Spirit 
will get hold of us. And the redemption of Christ will engage us so that we will be willing to follow Him wherever He might lead. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Would you please rise for our closing?